Good morning, Douglasville, and all those who are watching in our digital church platform. We're glad you're with us today. Today we're in the second part of our sermon series on effective prayer. Today we're going to look at how to find God's will and how to pray into that. And I think you're going to be really uh, pleasantly surprised with what you see and what you hear today. If you're with us for the first time on, in our church, on our service, we'd love for you to let us know you're here. Give us a wave in the comment section. If you give us an email, we'll reach out to you. We would love to connect with you uh, any way you would choose to have us do that. And so today you're going to see in our worship service different styles of worship because here at Douglasville First we offer different styles of worship. So when all this COVID stuff is over, if you're looking for a church home, know that you can find what you're looking for here. Stay with us today. Let's learn and lean into God's will and find out how we can discover it effectively.
Brothers and sisters, you may remember that our founder, John Wesley, tells us to do all the good that we can. Well, you're doing that. This week, during our drive-by dinner church, we had so many people participating that we're going to need to increase the number we're serving by 25. Please continue to give generously as you have been in any way that you choose. Also, please take a look at the number on your screen and text to give at that number. Now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Most holy and wonderful God, we come to you this morning just praising you because you are a great God. Lord, you've been with us this week as we have faced another week of COVID. You've stayed with us as we have tried to deal with social distancing and being physically away from the church. Lord, you've been with us as we have struggled with unemployment and with difficult situations in the streets. And Lord, we thank you because the fact is you've never left us. We are so grateful to you. We have to pause, Lord, and praise you for the peace that you bring to us, even in the midst of turmoil. Lord God, we pray today 
that your will would be done in our country, in our lives. Lord, we seek your will. We want to understand your will. Lord, we pray that we would be people who live out your will in all that we do. So often, Lord, we're in a hurry to just ask things of you. Lord, we ask, we do ask, and we've been told that when we ask, you will hear us. And so we thank you for hearing us today. We thank you, Lord, for being with those who have lost loved ones. We thank you, Lord, for being with those who have received healing as we prayed for them. We thank you, Lord, for those who have been able to break addiction with your help. Lord, you are busy and you are at work. And we know that we simply need to tap in to your plan to discover what you're already doing in the world. So help us to do this this week. Lord, may your spirit fill us and fill this church to overflowing that we may indeed carry your word into all the world. We pray this morning as Pastor Scott brings your word to us. Help us be ready to hear what you would say to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So as we said in our introduction, we're continuing our series on uh, effective prayer. And we're using the Lord's Prayer as a guide for effective prayer. And I want to remind you of what we said last week, that uh, this by no means takes away from uh, the authority and the, and the passion of saying the Lord's Prayer just like it is. Uh, plenty of times we know that that's powerful and effective. But I believe Jesus gave us things to use in multiple ways. And so if this is just a guide, then, then it works for us. And so we're using the Lord's Prayer in that manner uh, in this. And so I'm going to read our scripture today, at least the first part of our scripture. It's in Matthew 6. Uh, beginning with verse 9, and you can say it along with me if you want to. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We started last week talking about the first part of that, and we talked about that it was really a form of praise and worship. And it was calling us into a place of worship so that when we get to the rest of the prayer, our faith is built up because you cannot worship God. You can't sing about Him and, and praise Him and, and remind yourself of all the great things He's done without having a little faith boost. And so that's what we talked about last week. And you need that faith boost because this very next section that we just read, uh, seeking His kingdom, seeking His will, not ours, uh, to be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's probably the hardest part of this prayer. And I'll be honest with you, some of you may not even like me when this sermon's over because it's that tough. And I want to say you can't, you can't callously go into this. You can't take this lightly and just kind of breeze through this part of the prayer because the heartbeat, the crux of everything that's in the whole prayer lives right here. We've praised God. We've worshiped Him. We know He's a big God. We're ready for that. Our faith is built. And now He says... What I really want is for you to seek my will, not your will. Father, let us have your way, not our way. And there's so many things about this prayer that we could look at this morning and so many aspects. I could probably spend six weeks just on this section of the prayer. So we're going to try to get through it in a, in a way that makes sense, in a way that gives you the ability to dig deeper if you want to. But we're going to go to Matthew chapter 26 because I think the greatest way that Jesus modeled this he had to absolutely do this himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember the scene, Jesus is in the garden, and he's wrestling with, with God. Because in just a few hours, he's about to go through the crucifixion. We, we think sometimes he's wrestling with the idea of suffering and torture, but I don't think that was it at all. I think the idea that Jesus had the hardest time with in that garden was that even for a split second, for a moment, we don't know how long that moment lasted, when sin came on him, fully, he was going to be separated from the Father. And in that separation, 
You have to understand, Jesus has been connected with the Father for all eternity. There's never been a moment in all of existence that they've been disconnected. Now, because of our sin, He's going to be disconnected, even if it's for just a brief second or a few moments, but He is disconnected. So in verse 39, we see that wonderful scene where He says, Going a little farther, He fell with His face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And so in that moment, we see probably one of the most honest and and vulnerable moments of Jesus' life here on earth, where he had to say, look, I don't want to do this. This is not something that that I'm going into uh, clapping about. This is something that's hard. And I don't want to have to do this. But Lord, it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. What What we could say another way, that may help us here, is Lord, help us have your fatherly will. We know when we're raising kids, for those who have kids and those who don't, you understand this illustration, that as we're raising kids, as parents, we are supposed to know what's best for them. So when they fuss about a bedtime, or they fuss about what they eat, or they fuss about not getting something they want, we as their parents are supposed to know better. And, and, and sometimes when they're young, especially, we insert and assert our parently will our mother, as mothers and fathers because we know what's best for them as they grow older we hope they'll listen to us when we say this might be a better way we hope you'll cho- choose this path they don't always do that do they because they're wrestling with their will versus our will but how many times could we tell the story uh, throughout all of us in, in the congregation of times if our kids had just listened right and so That's kind of what's happening here. We're saying to God, God, we really want your will. Or at least that's what we're praying. But then we say things like, we we use this phrase that uh, your kingdom come, your will be done. And and I've heard people use that in prayer and say, look, I don't know what the right thing to do is. I'm not sure if God's going to answer my prayer, but just as long as it's his way, his kingdom first. And and that's a good thing. But sometimes we use that as a cop out. We almost say your kingdom come like an epitaph on a, on a, tombstone don't we well i really want it this way but if god wants it another way we'll do that Um, and 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 so we miss the fact that god created us to know him to be known by him he created us to be maximized in this world to be used to be filled with joy to be filled with peace to to work in such a way that we're effective on this earth and effective in a way that not only makes others better, but makes us better. God gave us spiritual gifts and He gave us temperaments and He gave us personalities and He gave us talents. All of those things He had a perfect will for and a perfect way to work that out. The problem is we tend to insert our own will most of the time and we start fighting Him on that. And so what happens when we get to this part of the prayer, the thing that we really wrestle with here is what's revealed to us is our sin nature. Because we're not really thrilled about God's will all the time. Because we really, 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 really want it our way. And by saying we really want it our way, we are in that battle. We're in that moment where we know we should pray God's will. We kind of know theologically that God probably has the best way. But we've kind of figured it out. And we know what we want right now. And we know what it's going to be like right now. And so that's where our sin nature begins to wrestle. And I don't mean sin nature is in we want to go do wicked things. I mean sin nature just that we want our way. When I received my call to ministry, it's a long story and it was a long process. But the night that I knew without a doubt in my mind that God was saying, Scott Brown, I'm calling you into the full-time ministry. I'm calling you to preach my word. That night, when I heard that word spoken to me, I had a decision to make. Now, I had lived a a good life as a kid. I I was young even when that happened. And and I really wanted to follow God, but I really didn't want to be a preacher. I absolutely did not want to do that. I, I wanted to serve God, do all these other things, but not be a preacher. So that night, because I knew God had said, this is what I want for you, I had to make a decision. Was it going to be my way or his way? Now, my way wasn't bad. I was going to be a good person. I was going to do things for the church. I was going to teach Bible studies. I just didn't want this as an occupation. But I had to pray something that night in in, in an honesty that maybe I hadn't prayed before. And I said, God, I know you. And I know that if this is what you're telling me to do, as much as I don't want it, 
it'll be okay, and it'll actually be good. So I'm going to say yes. I'm going to go against my will and say yes to your will. And you know, that was the most incredible decision I made because it wasn't very long after that that he put a passion in me that if I could pick today any one thing to do in this world, I'm doing it. Because he gave me that passion once I submitted and surrendered my will to his call. And so we have to look at God, not like a God who wants to do bad things to us. One commentator, probably about 100 years ago, wrote this. He said, if God were, were an evil God, then the greatest way for him to show us his evilness is to grant us what we want all the time. Because he, if he really did grant us everything we asked for and prayed for, we'd be in a bad place. A more modern sage named Garth Brooks said it this way, Thank God for unanswered prayers. Because we can look back and say, Thank you, God, that you didn't give me what I wanted then. Thank you, God, that you, you didn't answer that prayer. I mean, think back. Who would we be married to? Where would our life be? What jobs would we be doing? What would we be about if we had answered the prayers of 18-year-old Scott and 17-year-old and you and all the things that we thought we just had to have in this life? And God said, you know what? I'm going to give you my way. Now, sometimes he allows himself to be sovereign in that way, and he does that. But as we get older and as we start to make these decisions, as we start to try to drive through life, what we want is to be in prayer and agreement with the Spirit of God. What we find instead is that we are really struggling and wrestling with God most of the time. And we, we, we get on a course and we get locked in, maybe through family values, maybe through a course that we've chosen in our life, maybe through passions in our life, maybe through mistakes in our life. But we kind of get locked into some things and we say, this has got to be the way to do it. This has got to be the way you handle this. This has got to be the answer out of this problem. And, and we start trusting our instincts more than we trust what God may speak into that moment. We avoid accountability. We avoid uh, voices of reason in our life because we really do want our way. So the question comes down to this when we pray. We've prayed. We've worshipped. We've built our faith. Now we're ready to come to God and say, God, give us your will. But we don't want that to be a sad thing. We really do want your will. We've kind of we've kind of realized it's a good thing uh, as Christians and as people who are seeking after you. So we really want your will. So the question comes down to, when we really pray that, whose will are we really praying in every situation, in every circumstance? And you can take it one by one, piece by piece if you want to, but who are we really interested in praying to, and how are we really willing to let that will be worked out for us? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. We say sometimes we're praying for our nation. Um... I was in a prayer group years ago, four pastors, three other pastors and myself. We met together every week, and uh, we just fellowshiped. We prayed together. We shared together. We were all in small churches, and it was just our way of helping each other out. But at the end of the time, we'd always pray together. And one day, one of the guys was feeling very, very spirit-filled, and he said, you know what? I want to pray for revival in America. And I thought, wow, that's a good prayer. But the Spirit kind of checked me on that, and I said to him, I said, well, listen, I'm with you. Nothing I would love more than revival in America. But let me ask you this question. Are you willing to let America go through whatever it's going to take for revival to happen? And what I meant was, in my estimation, for revival to happen in America across the nation, the first God of America would have to die, and that's our, the God of money and the God of resources. And so... I asked him, I said, are you really, really willing to pray that God would do this, knowing it may be an economic collapse? Now, I knew our prayer probably wasn't going to cause that, but I wanted him and I wanted us to focus on the fact that if we're really going to pray God's will, we have to receive the answer any way God chooses to bring it. We pray for our nation right now. We pray for America. And, 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 I, and I find Christians doing this, and I see it on social media. I hear it in conversations. Pastor, we need to pray that God will bring America back to what it was. We need to pray that God will get back in America and, and we'll get things back like they used to be. Now, I've got friends who are conservatives and I've got friends who are liberals. And they're all praying for God to, to heal our land. And they're all praying for God to do this thing in America and make it what it needs to be. But they're praying different things. 
They're praying according to their particular political party's agenda. One group wants it to be uh, America and, and, and values and, uh, and, and all of these things that right, kind of right-wing stuff. The other side wants justice and they want, they want some healing in some areas and they're praying a lot of things in that direction. And, and we're not even praying the right thing all the time. We're not even looking for God's will. We're praying down our party line sometimes because we're convinced and we've read enough stuff on social media to be convinced that we're right. And it's hard. I'll tell you what I did. I'm, I'm kind of mean sometimes like this. I did kind of a, a wicked thing uh, back when uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were running for president. And one thing you'll never hear from me is, is, uh, is a political side. I may have opinions. I may have things. But the pulpit is for everybody. And so uh, you don't know how I vote. and You never will. But as Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were running for president, there were some very different, distinct opinions running through our nation, if you remember right. And uh, I had this, I had, matter of fact, I did this to several people. It worked so well. And, and this one woman came to me and she goes, we need to really pray for this election. I said, I agree. And I said, what are we praying? And she said, we got to pray for Donald Trump to win. I said, okay. Does that mean we're really going to pray for this election and we're really going to pray for what God wants and we're going to pray God's will into this? They said, absolutely. Because they were convinced that when we prayed that prayer that God was absolutely going to be for one candidate over the other. And so I asked this question. Now this was a very, matter of the few times I did it, this one particular time was a very uh, conservative Republican. And I said, all right, we're Christians, right? She said, yes. I said, we really want God's will. Absolutely. I said, what if we pray and what if God says, vote for Hillary? This person couldn't stumble fast enough and back up quick enough. And they said, there's no way. God would never, ever do that. There's no possible way. I said, you didn't have, you're not answering my question. You want God's will, but what if God said to you, pray for a candidate you couldn't support? Would you do it? And, and, and I did that kind of in a teaching moment. Uh, it was kind of a mean trick, but think about that for a moment. Are we really wanting God's will? And does God have permission to speak into our prayer, to speak into our life, to speak into our moments, and are we willing to do what He says, even if it seems like something we never thought we would do? Even if it seems like something that goes against what our instincts tell us. I'll give you a better example. More, Let's come home a little bit with that. We pray in the church, God, restore the church. We want the church to go back to the glory days, right? I mean, we all do. There was a time when these churches all across America were filled. There was a time when our balcony was standing room only. There was a time when people came to church and, they, and that was the thing you did. That's been going away for quite some time now. And 85% of churches in America are less than 100 members in worship on a Sunday before COVID. We're going to come out of COVID and it's going to be even less in every church simply because of, of fear and because of, of changes of habits, all kinds of things. So we've got churches that are saying, God, if we could just go back to the way it was, if you could just restore things so that we could go back and have the classes like we had them and have worship like we used to have it. Well, I believe God wants that. I really do. But I wonder sometimes when we pray that prayer, are we praying it so that church will look like we always had it? Are we praying it so that church will be the kind of church we knew all of our lives? Or are we open to the idea that God does want to fill the churches back up? He wants the churches being active, but He may want it to look different. He may want it to have a different feel to it. I don't know this. Don't anybody freak out on me and think we're going to start changing everything. But just the fact that that causes us some discomfort, even asking the question, tells us, that there's a part of us that still wrestles with this question, is it His will or is it my will that I'm praying? Proverbs 9.10 is one of my favorite Proverbs. Uh, my son and I actually wrote a song to this years ago because I was trying to, 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 to get this word into him uh, as, a young, as a young boy, and I was trying to wrestle with it on a whole other level in my life. In Proverbs uh, chapter 9, Verse 10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we want to know what the kingdom's about, we have to come into this place where we're in awe of our God. It doesn't mean to be afraid of God. It means to have the ultimate respect for God. It means to be so in awe of His presence that, that we are willing to just take whatever He says. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Knowledge of the Holy One is where we gain understanding. So if we're going to pray God's will, we have to gain knowledge of God. That means that we need to be praying and studying Scripture as we pray. That means we need to start letting the Word of God guide us in those places that we're praying for His will. That means we need to really be pressing in and laying our souls down at the altar in a position and in a posture of surrender so that His will can be voiced. One thing I've learned about God is He won't speak over us. He, he won't he won't shout over the noise that we create in our own hearts and our own minds and our own lives. He'll wait for us to get quiet. He'll wait for us to listen. He'll wait for us to come to that place of surrender. Because He's not going to cast pearls before swine, as Jesus talked about. He's not going to throw something as valuable as His Word out there and not have us listen. So, when we come to this prayer, and I told you this was tough, and I told you you, you might get mad at me for this, but if we're going to really pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, on imperfect earth as it is in perfect heaven, we want what you want. And so I'm going to lay my life here. I'm going to lay this issue, whatever I'm praying about here, whatever my concerns are here, whatever direction I think I'm trying to take my life, and I'm going to lay it down and I'm going to be surrendered to you. And Lord, whatever you say do, I'll do. How you say move, I'll move. How you say worship, I'll worship. How you say lead, I'll lead. How you say vote, I'll vote. Whatever the case is. Can you imagine if, if just the church, just Christians in this nation sincerely prayed that prayer one moment and we all heard the voice of God? We might understand a direction that would heal 90% of the issues we deal with in this world, in this life. My guess is there'd be a lot of repentance, there'd be a lot of tears, and that's okay because we'd know the will of God. This is hard. This is a very, very difficult place to pray. So I don't want us to breeze by this and blow by it when we come to this part of the prayer. I want us to spend some time here. If you're going to pray effectively, which is what this series is about, this is the part of the prayer you have to spend the time on. God, help me move out of the way. You know what happens? God said, you shall have no other God before me. That was the first commandment. And the very first thing we do in self-will is we build our own form of God. It looks a lot like us. It sounds a lot like Christianity, but it looks a lot like us. And, and, and because we do things a certain way, and we do things a good way and a right way, and a way that's effective sometimes in our world, we call that good and we call that God. But even those things have to be laid before God. Even those moments have to be laid and say, God, you lead me in this moment. Because what we do when we force our will into our circumstances is we become our own gods. And we literally put ourselves before Him, which is breaking the first commandment. This is a lifetime of work to get to a place we can pray this. But I think God honors it the moment we start trying. I don't know that we'll ever get there in this life perfectly. Um, I struggle with it just like everybody else. But I think there's moments and seasons that we get it right because we're trying. And I think there's those moments when God honors our hearts. And He says like He did to David in Psalm 51. He said, I don't want your offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. I want a broken and contrite heart. That's what I'll honor. And so when we can come to God and truly be surrendered to Him, even when we're not quite there, I think the effort alone gets His attention. And I think He wants to speak into our world and speak into our moments and speak into our life. And so I invite you during this part of the prayer, you've built your faith, you've worshipped, your faith is strong because of the first part of the prayer. You've remembered all the great things God has done. And now you get the chance to ask Him what His will is. So use that big faith and come to that place and say, God, you're big enough that I need to surrender 
myself at the altar to hear what you have to say into my life and be willing to listen. That's the moment I think you'll see something supernatural happen in your prayer life. That's the moment I think you'll start seeing things get unlocked in your life that you've been struggling with. That's when chains get broken. That's when bonds get let loose. That's when we get free. And so, as tough as it is, I want you to stick with it. And I want you to press into this place. And I want you to really work at trying to find out, is it my will or His will? When you're talking about your church, when you're talking about your country, when you're talking about your family, when you're talking about your own personal life, whose will do I really want here? And am I willing to surrender? So I'm going to pray for you. We're going to close out the sermon. I invite you to comment in the, in the comment sections, again, especially if you're new with us. But if you've got questions or you've got thoughts, we want to, we want to reply to those things. And uh, if you struggle in this area and you want to contact us during the week, you can email us, uh, go to our website, uh, check in with us, let us know that uh, you've got questions. We will be glad to talk to you about this and help you walk through this. Uh, because this is not easy stuff. But it's good stuff, and it's stuff that's going to make your life better, and it's certainly going to make your prayer time more effective. So let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for showing us your word. Thank you for all the things that you are. And Lord, as we as a church and we as a Christian community and we as individuals seek to find your will in our lives, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we would have the strength to fall down, the strength to surrender, the, 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 the obedience to know that your way is going to be better than our way every single time. And if we'll get used to falling into that, Father, we're going to see amazing things happen through our prayer life. And I thank you in advance for every single one that's going to happen. And we give you all the glory, all the praise. Jesus, it's all in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to continuing this series next week. And uh, we hope that if there's a need in your life or you'll join us for some of our outreach ministries, join us when we can come back together. But stay with us on our digital church platform. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Take another step.